There we are. Lovely. So we've got transcript well <laughs> captioning and recording. Jolly good. Good. Let me try something out in the chat. So hello everyone. Welcome to our session. Oh, people are arriving. Welcome, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, I can see that we've got 16 minus three, uh -huh. so 13 people yeah. here. Oh, numbers rising. Welcome, welcome. Nice. <laughs> nice to see you all. Now, look, in true secondary school lesson planning tradition, you have a do now activity. Uh, Catherine is popping instructions into the chat. Please do introduce yourselves if you'd like to. Welcome. So your do now task um, has also been differentiated. So if you would like to read each of those sentences and then see if you can pop a number in, you can do it with the help box in the corner there or without you decide what you need. Welcome numbers. Oh, hey from up. Germany. Exciting. So yeah, people good. arriving. Perhaps we should give a prize to someone who's nearest. <laughs> I'm here in North London, Catherine in South. Although um, you might think I was in the South of France, but I'm not. I'm in Lewisham, <laughs> Canada. No, so a prize amazing. for the nearest and a prize for the furthest, perhaps. <laughs> so is Germany our furthest afield so far? Canada, no Nova Scotia. Welcome. What's the I'm weather still. like in Nova Scotia? Have we got some snow <laughs> or not <Cold>. yet? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Well, as it should be. Portugal. What time is it in Nova Scotia? Is someone up early or staying up late? Please do. Oh, gosh, morning. Gosh, that is early. Quarter to seven in the morning. Well done. Well done. Well That's done. very limited. <laughs> Perhaps just as well that it's cameras off. <laughs> Welcome everybody, nice to see you all arriving. We've been asked to wait a few moments to let people in and so accordingly uh, have provided you with a starter activity. Uh, please do read the sentences. So this is talking about uptake at GCSE, so the General Certificate of Secondary Education, the examination that our students take at 16, uh, used to be a school leaving exam, isn't anymore. So one big question I think that we might ask nationally is, why we are still doing this. Um, and I think that's something that Estelle Morris leads on, former education minister. She's very keen on us asking what the GCSE is actually all about. And over the last couple of years, I think a lot of teachers have been asking the same question. What is the purpose of this examination? And it's a very powerful one in our system. We are an assessment led system. Our schools are measured by their GCSE results. It's a mighty powerful test. So can you fill the gaps with some numbers? Help box in the corner should you need it. Hopefully trying to practice what we preach. So a starter task which we have differentiated. We can't see you. We were saying how hard it is as teachers um, not to be able to read the room, but so many teachers are used to this now, talking to uh, empty spaces. But please do, as I say, uh, introduce yourselves, drop a note. Catherine's monitoring the chat at the moment. Once I start, we're going to ask people not to use the chat but we're going to pause between the two of us speaking to give you a chance to re-engage. So if you're happy to listen for about 15 minutes to myself, then we'll have an interactive moment. Then Catherine has some thoughts to share before we finish with some Q&A at the end. 
So any questions that I need to address, Catherine, before I get started? No, I'm just delighted that we have such a range of locations. We've got Cambridge, Bristol, Portugal, Swindon, Marlow, Brighton, Kidderminster, Poland, all sorts of fantastic places. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. But no questions so far, I think, have come Lovely. through. All right, so our plan of action then is to model for you a wonderful university school partnership where we'll work together uh, to share some thoughts um, that we've had about what we think constitutes best practice in teaching and learning of languages. Um, and I thought I'd start by contextualizing the discussion before introducing ourselves more fully and then launching into a few thoughts from myself before handing to Catherine. So let's see how you did then. Let's see if you managed to get this right. Oh good, this always happens. <laughs> My PowerPoint has frozen. Trepidation. There we are. So 78% of students in England did a GCSE language. That was a point where the national curriculum made languages compulsory for all to 16. In 2004, uh, the new Labour government, that was David Miliband when he was Education Secretary, removed languages from the Key Stage 4 offer. The national curriculum was launched in the early 90s and what happened was it was simply too full. There were not enough hours in the week for students to be pursuing 14, 15 GCSE subjects that all ended in an examination. So at that point, the requirement was pared back and languages disappeared from that core offer. So what's happened since then? Oh, goodness me, really playing up now. There we go. Uh, since 2005, um, as predicted, I think most teachers would say the eight GCSE entries have halved. So we are in trouble. We have not got enough 16 year olds learning our subject. The government ha responded to this in 2011. We had a new coalition government and they introduced something called the EBAC. And what they were saying was we want 75 percent of students meeting the EBAC um, or studying the EBAC subjects, and that will include a language by 2025. It was downgraded from 90% when it was clear that there was no way the government was going to meet that number. Um, and then the 90% was moved to 2027. So uh, those of you who are interested in reading more, I will share the PowerPoint at the end of the session so you can come back and help yourself to the PDF of this. Um, do have a look. Uh, I don't know, Catherine, if you want to pop that link into the chat, but do have a look at the British Council Languages Trends Survey. That's an annual survey. It doesn't make for happy reading. Um, the only thing that you might say is, but it's not all of the schools in the country contributing, um, but it is a number of schools who respond to questions to give a flavour of how things look. And things are not looking particularly happy and healthy in terms of uptake. And that's the same at A-level. Clearly, if we haven't got them at 16, we haven't got them there to persuade them on to 18. So GCSE and A-level um, both are in trouble. So it's absolutely right that the DfE is looking at ways to solve this problem. However, we are concerned, just like the all party parliamentary group, that the current response, this quick fix of revising the GCSE, the Ofsted subject review suggesting that we should focus on three pillars, that students should be tested according to that framework, is problematic. We think, just like the APPG, that this needs more time, that the subject community needs to be more involved, that we need to be done with rather than done to, and that there may well be some unintended consequences. We're concerned that if you reduce expectations of the final examination, we might see a reduction of expectations in terms of the joys that our subject can offer. And we almost certainly will see a, a further reduction in the number of people taking A-level. The leap between the proposed GCSE and the current A-level is already big, is already a challenge. It looks to become even larger. 
And if people are tempted, as they often are, as I said, it's a very powerful test, the GCSE, to teach to the test, then we are worried that our students are going to be served an impoverished diet. Uh, so who are we and why do we care? My okay. name is Caroline Conlon and I'm the subject leader at the Institute of Education for the PGCE and I also supervise Master of Teaching students. Um, I trained myself in the late 80s at the Institute um, and really have devoted my working life to thinking about successful languages, teaching and learning. Um, Catherine. Hi, good morning, everyone. Yes, um, I've had a very close relationship with the Institute of Education over the years, having been lucky enough to train there myself <clears throat> um, over 20 years ago and have always worked in uh, language colleges. Um, and I'm now um, head of languages and lead practitioner at the Greycoat Hospital, um, but working closely with the Institute on uh, an initiative that I think Caroline will tell you a little bit more about. So what we said was, if we are being told by the DfE what constitutes best practice, and actually in some cases how we should teach, it's really important that we as practitioners come together to exercise our professional agency to think about what we believe constitutes best practice. Um, so we joined together uh, with our partnership school, Greycoat Hospital and others, um, to ask what does our vision for best practice look like? So we had a meeting in the summer, two meetings. We had a, a launch meeting uh, at Catherine's School, and then we had a follow-up meeting with our mentors at the Institute, where we really thrashed out, what do we think best practice looks like? What are we after? Um, and we wrote our vision statement. And we said, of course, the foundational principles of um, phonics, vocabulary, and grammar will be part of the offer, but we have to go beyond. So it's it's really a kind of Buzz Lightyear call to say, you know, to the three pillars and beyond. Um, and it's really a call to say it's about teachers exercising their professional agencies, agency. So Shirley Laws, who uh, was a former uh, subject lead at the Institute, writes about that notion of training versus education. And what we want to do is we want to say, actually, are teaching professionals are well-educated professionals. They've been educated to master's level. They know about theory. Hopefully they continue to work with that theoretical underpinning. They have a toolbox from which they can pick their tools and they can judge wh which tool to use when. They don't need to be told by other people how to teach and what to teach. The joy of this job is about being an autonomous, creative professional who takes their professional responsibility to ensure learners get those exams, but also who remember this is about education. Oh, lovely. Someone's reacted with a heart. <laughs> Love it. Please Yay. do. Please do <laughs> react. Lots and lots of positive things to keep me going. I have had a coffee, but please do. Um, so we talk about uh, this notion of practitioners being theorists. Let's not be done to, let's be done with. Um, one of the challenges at the moment is that everybody is exhausted. Uh, we know that our public sector is stretched to breaking point. We know that our teachers are tired. Um, but what really, this is a call to our professionals to say, let's actually from grassroots up, take control of what we think works, what we know works. It's not first I read some theory and then I do my practice. As Jane Jones at King said, the divide is false and unnecessary. Um, there's an ac um, open access um, link there to the book that we wrote, Colin Christie and myself, looking at success stories. We felt exhausted by the number of kind of doom and gloom tales, particularly in August, that we read. So we asked our London provider colleagues to share some thoughts with us on what they see in classrooms that they think constitutes success. Uh, the joy of working in um, initial teacher education is that we get to go into classrooms throughout the year. So since 2011, I think I've been in almost 40 languages classrooms a year. 
Um, some great quotes here again, this idea that theory must enable teachers to make a principled choice. So at the Institute of Education, we talk about the fact that we are educating highly competent practitioners, principled professionals and educational thinkers. We want linguists in charge because, you know, look at us now at the Institute, we have Professor Lee Wei. There is nothing more joyful than having a linguist in charge. Um, and he his writing really kind of speaks to us um, and the links from our pages to his work are there for you to enjoy too. Um, but this quote here, there is no place for dogma, ideological, theoret theoretical or methodological. What we want is teacher led, learner centered curriculum and pedagogical innovations. But as I said, people are tired, people are working in their silos. And so how do we come together? And that's what we've been trying to think about. How do we create hubs of practice where we share things that we know work in our contexts? Um, Benati, another great um, person to engage with, he talks about this idea of not looking for the right method. There is not a quick fix to our subject. It's complex. The quick fix is highly trained, well-educated teachers who make principled choices. And in a moment, we're going to have a look at some of those principles. Um, and as Lee Wei says, you, we're in the classrooms, you're in the classrooms. Um, you know what's going on. He talks about don't let theor theoreticians tell us practitioners we can't do theory. You're doing theory and testing theory every time you step into that room. Oh, good. Thank you. Lots of thumbs up and hearts. <laughs> um, at a mentor meeting this week, one of our mentors said, which theorists do you reference on your course? Who is informing um, kind of student thinking? Um, and it was very lucky. I just prepared for this talk today. So I had a list to hand. These are some of the names. We reference Rod Ellis when we talk about second language acquisition. We reference Suzanne Graham um, when we talk about motivation. Mike Grenfell and V. Harris uh, have written over the years about um, in nurturing independent learners, fostering learners uh, autonomy. Bernadette uh, wrote um, a lot of things in the early days at, at SILT about being inclusive when our subject became one for everybody. She did a lot of work on how to be um, inclusive. Uh, Keith Johnson writing about uh, foreign language teaching and learning. The wonderful Barry Jones, you can access his work on the ALL pages. Jane Jones at King's, Ernesto Macaro at Oxford, Alex Moore, Professor Emeritus at the Institute, Norbert Pachler, who wrote the Learning to Teach in Secondary Schools for Routledge and edits the ALL Journal, uh, my lovely friend Anne Swarbrick, uh, who has written uh, a great deal over the years, and I can't see the last one, oh, Robert Waugh, uh, I've got the transcription at the bottom there, but Robert Waugh, who also works with uh, Ernesto. Mm -hmm. So these are just a few of the names. Um, and some of you will have uh, names on there of people that you know, people you've worked with, and you'll have your favourites. Here is mine. So if I've got any <laughs> colleagues in the room, they'll be chortling. Um, I talk about Zoltan Dornier all the time because I think working in an English speaking setting, motivation has to sit at the heart of what we do. My concern is that if we reduce our expectations in classes, if we reduce our expectations at GCSE, we are going to demotivate both our learners and our teachers. And the joy of teaching is thinking about how to solve learning problems for the group of young people sitting in front of you. OK. So, and I have to apologise to anyone, any of the theorists whose names started um, before D, so sorry to Colin Christie, um, because I needed Zoltan Dornier at the top of my list. <laughs> and um, colleagues will also tell you she loves a list. I love a list. Um, I came across this recently. It's written for people who are teaching um, English. Um, so that's something else. When we look at second language acquisition theory, we say that's great, but they're talking about teaching English. How does that pertain to our situation where we're looking to motivate learners in English speaking contexts who are um, 
wanting to learn uh, second languages um, and we have got to keep working with them to keep them going, particularly when it gets tricky. So this principled communicative approach, you won't be at all surprised to hear, has another list. Um, but in it, there's a very short, very um, easy to read uh, introduction. Uh, the colleagues talk about how the history of how we've got to communicative approaches, how we've moved from behaviorism through to language for communication, um, and that idea of language that's meaning focused. But they're not talking about task based learning where it's, uh, you know, creative chaos. They're talking about explicit scaffolded language instruction. So, yes, we are going to intervene and teach. Yes, we are going to plan for progression. Yes, we are going to differentiate. Yes, we're going to be aspirational, but it's not chaos. We are not trawling through masses of content without a plan. We have a plan. And he talks about explicit declarative input. So we plan it. We don't just shower them with random language in the hope that they'll acquire it. We plan explicit language that we support them in beginning to use so that it becomes automatized through controlled practice, which then becomes more open-ended. So perhaps going back to the PPP, present, practice, produce as an underpinning model. Um, I always reference Bake Off when we start talking about planning at this time of year, the basic recipe, PPP, and then you start to throw in a few more herbs and spices uh, as you gain confidence. I told you there'd be another list. Here's another list. So the principles then that these colleagues talk about are the idea of personal significance. Now that goes back to uh, Eric Hawkins, meanings that matter. And this is the point where we might talk about culture and we might talk about those things that have an emotional impact, a piece of music, a piece of literature, some popular culture. Um, I said yesterday, we don't want to be a humanity that has no humanity. It's at this point that we can explore common humanity people, things that bring us together, language and identity. That's, you can see, that's the one that really kind of speaks to me. Declarative input, so we've talked about this, explicit initial input that's really well planned. Controlled practice, there is still a space for those, some of those behavioral techniques, some drilling, some learning by heart, um, some memorization. Uh, focus on form, but what they say about this, which I think is really key, whilst maintaining an overall meaning oriented approach. And that's what really speaks to me. Let's keep thinking about getting these learners involved in the language, supporting them scaffolding and then letting go to see what they can produce. Formulaic language, so we want to be thinking about maximum transfer value, high transfer value uh, phrases, language exposure, I always say to our uh, student teachers when they say my school doesn't do target language but how will learners hear any French, German, Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic if you're not using it because it won't happen anywhere else um, and then this idea of the focused interaction so that pair work where they've genuinely got to ask a question because they need the information so those old kind of grids that we used to have where one had half of the information the other had the other bit I'm about to hand to Catherine. So before I sign off, um, just to share with you uh, the language's mission that we share at the IOE, that we certainly are talking about um, grammar. We talk about rules and, and in fact, I'm doing the grammar lecture on Monday. We certainly talk about sound spelling links. We certainly get students to talk about uh, their own languages and compare and contrast. And that's the other thing that really matters to us. We don't think we have linguistic novices in our urban classrooms. We have children arriving who are actually experts in a number of languages already, and that's something we do have to think about. I won't go too far into all of this because I know Catherine will come back to it. Um, there's another list. <laughs> Uh, I trained myself in, in 1987, so I think I probably read this for the first time then, and it stayed with me throughout. So, as you know, someone who comes from a monolingual uh, working class background from West Oxfordshire, um, 
why did I do languages? I did languages because I used to sit in my school thinking there must be more to life than this. And it was my languages class teachers who kind of, you know, when we tanked off to Germany in 1978, who showed actually there is more to life than this. Um, and so this idea of the emancipation from par parochialism. We've had a lot to say about what we think this year. So here are some links for you to pursue. As I said, we'd love it if you signed up to our vision and um, to the mailing list to hear more about what we're doing. And I'm going to ask you to just have a look at these and pop some things into the chat. Do any of these really speak to you? And do you think there is anything that if you were drawing up your principles, we talk about principled practice, what are those principles? Is there anything missing? So I will stop sharing and hand to Catherine and have a little look at the chat. Please jot some thoughts in. Um, Clil, yes, thank you. Thinking about the content, uh, thinking about how our subject uh, links with others, how we can be working with colleagues elsewhere in school, how language can be used um, across the curriculum. Scaffolding, absolutely key. Spontaneous as it occurs, wonderful. Cultural awareness and intercultural competence, without a doubt, that's something um, that we have on our languages mission list, something that we definitely think needs to be included. And that's the joy actually for us of working in a city with over 300 languages and cultures. Um, the role of technology, yes. Uh, retrieval, thinking about, I was teasing our student teachers this week, you know, that sort of um, the powers that be have woken up to memory recall and retrieval, but how on earth have we taught our subject without those things sitting at the heart of what we do? Uh, learning strategies, indeed, Ernesto Macaro's 40 years of language strategies, definitely something that we think about. And that sort of challenge, really, of teaching them to become um, independent. Uh, it won't happen just because we leave them on their own. Um, I, how do I feel about the work that NSELP are doing? I feel that it's an important response to the crisis, but I feel it doesn't go far enough. Um, I think we have to keep thinking about culture, intercultural competence, and that notion of language expertise already existing. I don't think that we go from um, novice to expert. We have linguistic experts to work with. We have lots of transferable skills to work with. The links will be on the PowerPoint and I will upload that over. Um, it definitely showing them the world beyond the classroom, global outlook. Um, Oh, that's all right, Fiona popped that in the Q&A. Um, but certainly that's where we've learned, haven't we, over the last two years, um, that we can confidently work remotely as we are this morning um, in a global way. Right, I need to be quiet. I'm going to put myself mm -hmm. on mute and hand to Catherine. So if I can ask you to um, stop adding to the chat now and we'll come back to it in a moment. And Catherine, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Caroline, and thank you, everybody, for your contributions and in the chat and in the questions. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more time at the end as well to come back to some of those points. But it's so great to be in a room with um, like minded people um, and uh, people looking at the same problems and, and situations that we're all facing. Um, and so I wanted to start um, just by reiterating that Caroline has made the point that at the Institute, you are very much educating teachers to encourage critical, autonomous professionals, confident in sound theoretical understanding, which we then apply and constantly refine in practice. And that's something that which has really stayed with me, having um, trained at the Institute over 20 years ago. And I do come back to that grounding all the time. And, um, and, and that's really important to me. And of course, with practice and reflection, we come, we come to find our own vision statement. We come to find our own way of doing things our own understanding of what it is we want our learners to experience and be able to do. But, and, and that's really what I want to share with people today. But I'm also minded that um, for, for colleagues joining the profession, it can be really, really confusing that there's so much 
there's so many kind of conflicting messages around at the moment in particular. And so I also wanted to share with you um, this quotation, um, which comes from Barry Smith, this slightly Marmite um, person I know, but love him or hate him. Um, he did a brilliant CPD session a long time ago that I attended and this this line from from him do not let a PE teacher or equivalent in bad shoes tell you how to teach French has really really stuck with me and that sense of um, knowing that you are the expert and knowing what happens in your classroom and what works in your classroom I think is is really important and that it speaks to that sense that uh, that notion that Caroline mentioned of teacher agency and also teacher expertise so um Indeed, 20 years of teaching is um, a long time, especially in languages education. And for some of you, I don't know how long you've been teaching, but these are some of the things which I've had to contend with over those 20 years. A number of changes in policy, curriculum, approaches to pedagogy, examinations, all of which have given me personally and, and collectively in the schools that I've worked in ample opportunity for reflection. And I think this moment in time is also one such moment of collective soul searching and a time really, as Caroline said, to revisit our core principles. Um, and a friend of mine recently shared with me, I think this is a Nigerian saying, that a smooth sea never made a good sailor. And we have to find our route. We have to keep a steady nerve, stick to our guns and know what it is, come back to those principles that guide us in our practice. Um, and so coming back to um, Carol, the, the Institute's um, mission, uh, what you are trying to um, have learners um, achieve, clearly in preparation for this talk and, and regularly, I kind of check in with myself and think, do we do this? Do we still do this? Is this still pertinent? And I did annotate, and I'm not going to go through this now, but you can see my kind of annotations. I'll share this with you at the end, that I'm really heartened to know that yes, still holds, yes, we haven't wavered, and yes, this is still uh, pertinent. And I want to speak briefly before I give you some examples of how it is. I think the, the four here um, on the screen, which I think are perhaps the most important to me or, or, or some of the ones which I have the chance to embed in my classroom every day. So this idea that yes, we are, we do have a responsibility for giving students and learners the tools for learning, not only now, but in the future. And we're really nurturing linguists on this journey, which never ends. And we're linguists ourselves um, who are learning every day. But I think it's the other thing to say to that is that this experience, and it links to the second point, needs to be really satisfying and really enjoyable and really stimulating if we are going to encourage lifelong learners. Um, we are sometimes called the discipline which um, enables, you know, teaches how to describe bedrooms. That's not really a stimulating content. So it's this idea of intellectual stimulation. Yes, the form is important. Yes, that's what we're trying to do is to work out how language works, but it can't be divorced from stimulating and exciting content. Um, to come back to this idea, I come back to this, my colleagues laugh at me and the students laugh at me all the time because I always say grammar is our friend, not in a kind of dry and dusty enterprise, nor actually in, as an end in itself, although that can be satisfying, but really as a stepping stone to independence, to know how something works in order to be independent and to master um, language and, and the ability to, to create things. Um, ourselves and that links of course to the fourth one the using language creatively for what we want to say Eric Hawkins the meanings that matter and it's um, that is really where the fun starts and um, so to practical application recently I led a CPD session which was supposed to um, describe best practice at key stage five and actually in that session I came to the conclusion that Key stage five begins at key stage three. I can't really speak about key stage two, not being a practitioner in primary schools. But if we isolate the skills, and they're on the screen here, um, the skills that we're trying to develop at A-level, really, we need to begin that work right from the beginning of year seven. I'm looking at spontaneity in particular, is that is really close to my heart. And so, um, I absolutely agree. Dornier's seven principles and the Institute's 10 principles are absolutely 
at the heart of good practice. But I don't know whether you agree with me, and maybe it's just my age, but sometimes having lots and lots of principles and lots of lists is quite a lot to keep in your in your mind's eye at any one time. So for simplicity and also for ease of kind of a retrieval, um, I find it helpful to pair things back and go to a, a trinity of three principles, which are on the screen now. So this idea of input, interaction, independence. Caroline called it the three Ps earlier. Um, and, and I've heard colleagues talk about this in, in different ways over the years. And it dawned on me as well that perhaps I'm being kind of influenced by Ofsted's three eyes as well, the, the intent, implementation, impact. But let's not talk about Ofsted. For me, it's input, interaction and independence. So input um, uh, is carefully considered, accessible and ambitious, interaction, which is controlled, which allows us to check understanding, but independence, which hopefully launches learners to play, to invent, to take a risk and to create. And it's that playfulness that sometimes gets lost in our classrooms. And so um, thinking then, what does that look like? So that we've, we've thought about what our principles and what we, what we agree with, what we, what we hold dear, but what does that look like at key stage three? And it might be through careful choice of target language, um, a range of texts which you might abridge, but importantly, it, it acknowledges that input is not the same as output. I think that's really important to say that we can interact with texts in a variety of ways, but that the point of an input is not only to exemplify what an output might look like. I think there's a bit of confusion around that at the moment. Uh, we know that we can often do a lot more receptively than we can productively, but we don't want to restrict learners so that we get 30 identical sentences, but that we create a space in which learners can have a go at what they've practiced. And sometimes we make mistakes, but actually that's really important because it's part of the, of the, the learning um, cycle. So I wanted to just share with you some examples of, of output of the creativity from students, one of them with a twist, which I hope you'll agree is, is quite um, interesting. So firstly, from year nine, um, so I'm a French teacher, so my examples are in French, um, but here year nine um, came up with, I can't remember what we were doing, I think it was this, the perfect infinitive after having, so after having buried my hamster, he grew back on a tree, my father was frightened of the tree, you will not find that in any textbook, but it's what that student wanted to say on that day, and I thought it was kind of, it spoke to me because I love this kind of surrealist approach to things, and we'll talk about that more later. Another one, here we go, year 11. Um, this one is a committed uh, uh, and engaged politician, clearly talking about communism and how she's going to de devote her time to converting the world to communism. I thought, well done you. That will certainly please, I hope, the examiners when they come to read your um, uh, exam. And then finally, this one, I thought this was this, this was quite interesting. Um, this, this was actually an Italian speaker, and it speaks to the idea that we have a repertoire of languages. Um, but this Italian speaker had, um, <laughs> I thank you for the, um, the, the, the laughs there. Apparently, I, I'm not an Italian speaker, but sciare is to ski in Italian. And of course, this um, speaker was thinking, right, okay, well, we do that thing. How would I do that? I'm going to work it out. It's probably going to be sciare, which of course means something completely different. But that was fantastic because it gave us a chance to, to think about how we um, go from one language to the other and then um, come back to correcting that sentence. But we all had a bit of a giggle when that one came up. So input, interaction and independence. And how does that look um, at key stage three? Well, we want to have with it, it. For me, it's about um, uh guiding my planning, not only sort of the learning journey from year seven to key stage five, but also within each lesson. This is really guides me within each lesson. I wanted to share with you three examples of, uh, sorry, two examples. I had lots more as Caroline knows, but I paired them right back. Two examples of how this principled communicative approach can be put into practice and has been put into practice in, in the classrooms that I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, so the first example I want to share with you is from year seven. This is a very sort of run of the mill lesson. Gosh, I'm a bit conscious of time here. Um, we might have been focusing on, on this kind of classic foundational grammar. We might have had some common vocabulary um, and we want to describe the world around us. That's where we are in year seven. And so I might go to um, context reading 
um, to present new language. We might choose to read aloud to students so that they can make connections between the spoken and the written word. We might zoom in on particular sounds like the, the W sound, uh, the S set, the SH, the function of the umlaut. We might pick up on compound words and see how they can seem daunting at first in German, but when you break them down, they're not as scary as they seem. We might pick on the function of GAN. We can use this input um, to, to pick up on lots and lots of things. And rather than having a kind of classic matchup, I might ask students to use the context in order to work out meaning. So that would be an example of um, an input. Whoops, excuse me. Um, oops. And then I might go to interaction and say, right, well, let's make some hypotheses, hypotheses here. What's the gender? How do I know the gender of Kino? How can I make, how have I made shops plural? How would I use this text to support saying something else? My town is fantastic. How would I say there's no cinema? I'd like a cinema, et cetera, et cetera. I might do a trapdoor activity whereby students practice reading aloud and have some fun, repetition, catch their partner out. And then I might open it up to independence and there's inbuilt differentiation with support and, and, and output. So I might say you simply substitute tol for something else, or you can use a dictionary and find something of your own choosing. Well, you could use this and move away from this a little bit and write something uh, meaningful for you. OK, so it's that idea of independence is actually a, a really fantastic mechanism to differentiate by support and by outcome. So my third, sorry, my final um, example comes from year nine. And this I wanted to show uh, an interaction really with culture, with literature, with cross-curricular opportunities, with CLIL perhaps, and really thinking about um, linking to A-level. And we know that year nine is such a critical year. Um, it is the year we know where students are making choices about their options, and we need to present languages as an exciting discipline in year nine, not just a subject which talks about holidays, but something which is inherently intellectually stimulating and rewarding. And it also speaks to students in a way that they can imagine themselves as an A-level student and as, as, an, uh, as a university student thinking about themselves um, analyzing a piece of literature or talking about a, a cultural movement and a great I think literature in particular is a great way to do this it's a great way we could interrogate uh, interrogate identity stereotypes decolonize the curriculum brilliant um, writers we could work on I've done some work on Senegalese writer Mohammed and Bougassa for example Edouard Louis talking about um, gender identity class etc there's so many great things and then just to, just to finish, I'm conscious of time. Caroline, do we know if we finish, if we get cut off um, because we're coming to the end of our time? Um, then perhaps we can just um, go, to, um, go to the chat for a few seconds at the end. But this is a, a project that I um, came up with. Um, uh, you'll know, I'm sure, about the Stephen Spender um, translation project, but I, I just thought, I'd, what do I fancy doing? I want to do something on surrealism, but I want to link it to the curriculum. I want to link it to what students have been able to do. And so um, obviously surrealism is about the kind of connection between the real and the, and the super real. And even in the title, there's a chance for creativity. Ilya and Beloiseau, there's a beautiful bird in, you'd expect it to be tree. And then the, the, the surprises in, in your hair, and, and then we would go through uh, a, a different input, maybe a picture, describe the picture, tell me about the picture, what's, what's um, disturbing in the picture, talk about some um, important artists. We could do that classic thing of um, using grammar to, to help you um, fill in the gaps of um, a particular text. That's a, a, an input and, in, and an interaction. We've got and two then, minutes, two minutes, okay. Catherine. Okay, so and I'm going to switch off. Chat. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps, sorry, without going into this, and, and you'll be able to see this um, uh, in the resources, but taking a poem, you can listen to the poem, there's the audio link, and working on it, so, so picking out things like words to do with this, so to do with nature, um, to do with the body, um, some really strange pairings of words um, to analyze together what is this poem um, allowing us to do we came up with this together this analysis we came up with together and then you could have students create a poem of their own 
of their own in a, in the style of of a surrealist. So this um, sorry that was a very kind of whistle stop tour of something which you might do, which is set up. And there's a great input. There's some controlled interaction. And yet it's focused on independence. So I think I'll pause there. I'll stop there. Um, and because I know we've only got a few moments left. I'd love to be able to carry on the, um, the, the presentation. Um, but I think if I just, how do I do this? Just scroll forward, you'll see all these different things. Here we are. Oh, yes. Perhaps we could say we both had, we each wanted to finish with a quotation. Mine is from Montaigne. Éduquer, c'est pas remplir les vases, c'est allumer les feux. It's not about filling vases, but lighting fires. And um, Caroline chose from um, the wonderful John Le Carré, which is about um, a promise to educate. Um, and it's about generosity, commitment, mediation. Anyway, there we go. Um, we've got to finish. We've got to finish. We, we, we will be switched off at any moment. Thank you so much, everybody, for your comments in the chat. Catherine um, has included there um, a link again to our project, talking to our partnership schools. This year we have 55 schools that we're working with. We've worked up with up to 80 in the past. Do drop us a line. I could see some different questions coming in the chat. We haven't had time to pick up and answer those individually, but please drop us a line join the mailing list. But most of all, please keep exercising that agency. Keep thinking what interests me, what motivates my learners, what makes them successful. This is about education, not schooling. This is not about passing a test. This is about the start of a lifelong journey. Let's help them pass that test as we fly past it in our rockets uh, to the moon. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, goodness me, inspired by your creative approaches. Thank you so much, everyone, and Thank for the everyone. fantastically supportive um, reactions and comments. And we're pleased that people have felt warmed by this. Um, it's wonderful. That's why we've run right to the time, because talking <laughs> about teaching and learning is what we all love. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Very, very nice uh, to meet you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Catherine. I yeah. just think okay. we will just are people still here? People heading off now. The numbers going down. So I'm just having a scanning at the chat. Yes, it's um oh, we're still wide. live. Um mm -hmm. we can keep saying inspiring things. Oh, film. We've added some film suggestions as yeah. well, short films as well as it's that's another presentation. We'll have to come back next year, Catherine. Yeah, I think so. There's someone asked about opting out of the EBAC and um the impact that, that will have on numbers. I thought that was a very good point. Um yeah, some really Wonderful. brilliant things in the chat. Great. OK, well, I think perhaps then you and I should sign off. Yeah, I'm just going to the tree stores. Yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah. OK, I'm going to press end. Right. And I'll see you soon. See you later. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye. Have a lovely day. You too. You're bye. there in the south of France. <laughs> bye bye.